So, uh, my name is Lisbon, and I uh, come from Fiskalika, and uh, I got the co-founder back in uh, 2008. And uh, so I'm here to talk about how we actually get the stuff that the ships want in the kitchen. How do we get the seafood that the ships want in the kitchen? How do we find out what the ships want, and how do we find projects that we can interest, in, interest the ships in? So, um, a brief introduction of me is that I'm a chef. First and foremost, I'm a chef, but I actually started to interest uh, myself in fish about uh, when I was six years old, when my father took me fishing. And uh, we went out fishing and we caught a fish and we took it home and we ate it. And that was like, that. that's when I started to interest, it, interest myself in fish. And uh, it's really basic that when you take a fish out of the water, you find that you're with a unique animal in your hand. You can use anything on the fish. You just need to know how. And that was what I took with me in, to my shift uh, experience after, is that you can use all of the fish. And uh, so when the opportunity came to start actually working with fish, I was uh, very quick to grab it. Because I always found that we don't see enough of the really good fish in Denmark. Back then, we didn't see any of them. So within the last 10 years, we've had quite uh, the uh, you see, we, in, uh, resurgence. Yeah, so a lot has happened within gastronomy uh, within the last 10 years. And uh, so on that ride, we have started to specialize even more in finding produce. And uh, so there's like four ways that we see in produce. So quality will always be the first and foremost. Um, and that's very closely jointed with catchment. And uh, learning how different catch methods actually give better fish is very important to understand what actually what the quality is. And then exclusivity is something that we also work with. So we always try to find produce that or fish, as I like to call it actually, fish and shellfish, that are exclusive and something out of the ordinary. Uh, um, of course, Miss Rika and it's a very big company now, we deliver to many types of restaurants and canteens and so forth. But within each segment, there's the right quality. And what I want to talk to you today is about the more extraordinary quality that we deliver to the top restaurants that we have here in Copenhagen and around. So, the last uh, thing that we have to focus on is uh, logistics. So, how can we actually make stuff happen? without it costing a lot of money because we can get anything in the world but the price might be too high. Maybe we have to fly in three kilos of these suckers and this is a crate called Landy Steam. It's caught in the north of Norway and it was caught by uh, uh, the same people that are catching the king crab up there. So this is actually one of the best pie catches that there is. We can get them in size two to four. So that is uh, two to four Landy Steams per kilo which is really large thing things. And uh, we are able to get them, but can we make it happen logistically? So if we only have to fly in three, five, six, eight kilos, there's no way we can do it. But not unless we have uh, someone who's willing to pay for it. But the thing is that we can do it, so now we need to create a market. And that's something we've been trying to do with, for instance, these ones, is to try to create a market. And when we are running and the season is there, which is, if you're interested, from April to about June. Uh, and when the season is actually there, we can supply it. Uh, and everything that we want. The price might be high, but that's the way it is. So the next one that I want to show you are these. And I think for Andreas knows this one quite well. This one is actually also from uh, the Faroe Islands. And this is where we actually started. Uh, when we started to get stuff that was really out of the ordinary it was when uh, a fisherman called Roderick Sloan, he phoned me and he said that uh, he was working with Nomad but he'd like to sell somewhere else in Nomad. So we uh, decided to make, uh, we tried to make like an impact in the market. So we were driving around with these ones every Tuesday night and uh, we had to pick them up at around 6. They might be ready somewhere from 6 until maybe 9 o'clock in the evening, but they didn't have a, a cold storage at the airport, so we had to actually wait until they were released and then drive directly to the restaurants and deliver their agents. So we tried it, we can do it, it's not something that we're going to make any money on anyway, but 
this interesting to have such an amazing creature. And working with these, we have also found out that these ones were there. So what I wanted to show in this uh, picture is that how stuff is actually coming now that weren't coming before. The system that you see in front here is, uh, is like a barrel, a large barrel, a cylinder barrel. Within the barrel, there's, there's a wooden, there's a, a, a pike, and the pike you can actually see in the right in the top hand there, there's a small hole in it. And within the actual tube of the cylinder, there are half moon shaped baskets that can hold and transport these uh, king crabs and other shellfish live in water. So that is the future. That is what we're looking at now, how to transport fish live from any destination in the world. These uh, king crab, they can stay up to three weeks in the tanks and they will not be bothered. So what we actually do is that we take water from the place that the king crab live and pump it into the cylinder. And then we keep it at about 0.5 degrees in a closed system, so the water is all the time in the same system and it's the same water that they live in. They can keep up to three weeks. And that's very interesting because now we can transport live animals that we couldn't before. We could transport the, the live king crab before, but we had to fly them in one piece at a time, and the cost was half freight and half produce. And that's something that really is not the best way to do because we're using too much money on packing and flying stuff that is really not giving anything to the product and they take the product up in such a high price class that we can't actually uh, sell it. So, among other things, I just wanted to say that we've been trying to get over the last year is freshwater clams from Lid Tisu. The mahogany clams, we have them all the time. Do you know the mahogany clams? It's an amazing product. They are, they, it's the oldest animal in the sea. They can uh, live up to more than 300 years. And um, basically, there's, uh, I hope there's enough, because uh, right now they're taking off. We started out with mahoganys, I think, maybe five years ago, and we, didn't, we couldn't sell any. We could sell maybe 20, 30, 40, but now it's come on the menu in a lot of places, and we're able to supply. So carpet clams, as you might know, do you know carpet clams? It comes from the north of Norway also. It's like uh, it's like the bungalow of the of the north. It's super tasty, it's super sweet, and uh, that also now we have in stock and we have all the time. It's something that we didn't have two years ago, and it's something that there's now no demand for. So another thing that we're trying to get now is the truffle snail. Do you know truffle snails? Yeah, you're gonna know them. It's gonna be big soon, uh, and uh, along with the along with the whelks that we didn't fish before, it's just coming in full on now that people are going to start to eat snails. And in Denmark we haven't eaten snails yet. So, looking at these criteria, you might think that this is, this is only for, for like high-end restaurants, but if you look at something, it's not the best picture, but uh, as you can see, it's called by a hook. This is a cod, the E-grade cod. So, what I learned when I came as a chef into the fishing business is that really, the biggest difference there is to a fish is the way that it's caught. So, uh, a cod caught by a hook and line that was caught maybe six days ago is much better than a cod that was caught in a lobster trawl two hours ago and left in the bag to run with. So, the way that these are caught is like the best way of catching a fish because you only hit the fish. There's a lot of other very uh, sustainable ways of fishing, but this for fish is the best and it's the oldest one. So we uh, try all the time to have fish caught by hook and line for the restaurants that I want to pay or really has a sustainable uh, look at it. And that's what we uh, talk about. The holistic theme of this uh, talk is that that's what we experience, that people are much more concerned with what is the impact of the stuff that we're actually using? When we're talking about the sea, really, how much can the sea take? If you ask a, an older fisherman, he says that, or some of them, they say, well, the sea just gives and gives. But if we look at it now, the, the truth of it is really that it doesn't. We have, to, we have to be very, very focused on how we take the fish from the sea. And uh, 
we started working with the fishermen that were working with sustainable methods in 2011 and we co-founded this uh, billion of uh, sustainable fisheries and one of the really really interesting things was to see is that how can we help them to make better produce when they have the best produce in the world how can we make that transform into something that is, is that has some sort of uh, evolution in it like how can it become even better so the people at Lamu which is a small coastal community in uh, the most western part of Lola, uh, where there are about nine fishermen there working, uh, which is very big for, for a city of about 100. Um, they were all fishing by gillnets. So in that specific port, there were no one talking about, oh, we also need to, to make things right for the people that use this troll. And we, you know, there was, there was no interest conflict there. So we could actually work with them to say, how can we make them deliver better fish for us? So that was in terms of logistics, setting up a better logistics for them, and actually talking to them, and how much time should you actually use on cleaning the fish, and how much time should you use on washing the fish, and how much fish goes in each box, because when we started out, the boxes, they can hold 25 kilos, but if you stack 25 kilos in one of those boxes, at least one of the fish is gonna get damaged. So we persuaded them to put only 15 kilos of catfish in one box and 20 kilos of cod in one box. It takes up the price for the fishermen, but we were able to get that price back from the customers because we were delivering better stuff. And all the time thinking about that is that this, these small fishermen are about to close now. If we don't do something dramatically and support them, they will. They, they, they would have closed already. So, but now tides have turned and we're going to get uh, I don't know how many people know this, but we're going to get the blue Ömer in Denmark. It's starting the 1st of 1st, 2020. That's when we're going to start to have uh, fish that are actually certified blue, which are organic or, how should we call it, 100% sustainable. And we're going to be the first country in the world to have a government, uh, a government uh, brand saying that this is sustainable, it's 100% sustainable. So something has changed and we hope much more will change. So oh, oops. See, there's my skills here. There you go. So this is something else that I wanted to talk to you about. So <clears throat> this is the T-shirt setup. So and this is a very interesting story. I have to make sure that I get everything. So the Tissue Center. We started working with the fishermen in Tissue. Uh, it's an older guy. His name is Axel, and uh, he used to be the biologist teacher at a very famous little college called Kalush. Uh, and uh, he had been given the right to fish in this lake, Tissue, which is the third largest lake, lake in Denmark, because the fishing there had turned to the worst. It was really, really, really bad. They needed something to change down there. They needed to change the dynamics of the lake. And uh, the thing is that Tisa is surrounded by some of the best farmland there is in Chile. And they, it has uh, two water streams running into Tisa that also runs along all of the fields. So it takes a lot of uh, nutrients to the lake. And what happens in the lake when you add a lot of nutrients is that it puts all uh, production into a higher level. So it's like speed amphetamine first for the algae, and then the daphne that lives on the algae, and then the smaller fish of each of lives on the daphne, and so forth and so forth. Only, you can't do that, because it's nature. So what happens is that if there's too much algae, there's too much algae for the daphne, and then you have the smaller fish, and then you get too many of the brim and the roach in there, and they start to eat from the bottom, and it clouds everything up, and then actually when you get what is the, the, the oxygen dies out. So it dies within a very short uh, period of years. You'll have a, uh, a large production, and then it will collapse. So what Axel did, and what we are doing now, is that uh, we're fishing out uh, about uh, 500 tons, which is about 500,000 uh, kilos of fish over the next three years, of roach and brim to take away to sell for bone flour and then we're putting out every year 
30,000 pike and 35,000 senat of this size so that they, we can try and turn this evolution around. We, he has been doing that for five years, so now we're actually harvesting these beautiful animals. And the guys fishing there, they use masks that are this big. Chocolate garden that you only use to catch cod size 2, which is 4 to 7 kilos. That's what we fish with in there. In order only to take the largest fish. And the reason why we do that is because a fish at this age is only four and a half years in big tissue, which is crazy. It's five kilos heavy. It's only four and a half years in tissue. If you put that in Fuzu, which is very resembling lakes, uh, fourth largest lake in Denmark, it's in the north, north of Copenhagen, uh, a fish like that would be six or seven years old. Because it's just a much cleaner lake, they spend a lot of money on cleaning it. But in Chisu, we have this massive production of food. So we need, to, we need to control this. And it's something that we use a lot of time on, on, on doing, and something that we have to use a lot of time on explaining. Because the sports fishermen, they come to us and they say, oh no, you cannot do this. Because you're taking away all the big fish, and then they can't reproduce. And it's just a matter of not knowing what's going on really. Um, and it's a private lake, so we're just allowing them to fish there. But hopefully they will understand. Because I'm a sports fisherman myself, I want to go out and catch all the big fish. But the, the, the story of it all is that a fish of this size is too expensive for the lake to have out there. The, the production, like the, the weight growth in order of, and what it eats gets much higher. It eats too much and grows too little when it reaches this size. We need to harvest the larger fish. And then, uh, really, uh, I just wanted to wrap it up and to say what we try to do most is to put focus on oh, we need to talk about this guy. So, this, this guy uh, was to say how do we actually find out how to get produce. So, this guy, his main product, he's called the, the crayfish uh, rocker, biker. So, he drives a Harley, has a huge scar going like this all over his head because he did his is uh, head on a boat crew when he was commercially driving, diving. And uh, we had big, big problems in uh, getting uh, wild dogs with the feathers on, like wild dogs not touched, because you couldn't buy it from all the uh, game stories. Uh, so we tried to get in touch with the hunters, but they said, oh, sure, you can get all the, the dogs if, if we shoot. And we might shoot zero or we might shoot 400. Really, it's very hard to do a business on it. You need 120 every Tuesday and every Thursday. But this guy, he was fishing for crayfish at all the big states in the field. So he had the right to fish for the crayfish there. And he was like maintaining those. So they, he just said, well, of course I can do that because I'll just do whatever I want. I will, I'm there every week. And uh, so he actually made that happen for us. So it really is about the people. Where you have to trust your suppliers. And uh, I want to... Let's, we've got to skip this one because this is uh, talking with the Oyster King about cultivating uh, Danish uh, uh, oysters. So I don't know if we have the time to do it. Five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes? Yeah. Okay, we'll do a brief one. So I just returned from France. Um, I've been there many times. Uh, we sell the most oysters in Denmark. And uh, the focus is, uh, of course, on the native uh, Danish oyster and on the gigas. We get the gigas from uh, actually from a wormer, uh, which is in uh, a and where they get hand collected. Um, but it's as the oyster king was talking about, it's very hard to actually do it because there is uh, all this regulation with water. And, uh, but I went to France uh, just to look at some more French oysters, and I, I got to thinking that we have to cultivate these oysters because we can harness the flavor much more, and we can make sure that we get best flavor and sometimes as in the late history human intervention has to be uh, to can be done uh, we still have the wild ones but human intervention in order to create the better uh, muscles this is actually a cockle a yarmouche thing uh, it was caught by hand uh, by a guy called Emmanuel uh, and then he takes it home and he puts it in the clear for 10 days he puts it in the clear as he puts the oysters in the clear. and this is by far the most tasty muscle I've ever had. It's 100% guaranteed, salt free, and the flavor of it has turned into something else. It's much more sweet, and it's much more clean flavored than what I've ever tasted. And if you look at the flesh of it, it really is 
very flashy. Uh, so I was just thinking that we should start to look at how we can cultivate these Danish oysters within the ABCs to see what we can do. So this would be another project for Fisk and Ikan to see uh, if we can do. And uh, what we try to do now is to, for instance, create stuff like this. So this is a fishing that's been done for many, 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 many years. Uh, Hundreds of years within the Rekum Fjord, you have a big uh, 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 migration of head. I don't know the word in English, uh, really. Uh, it's a small salmonoid fish at the Common size. white fish. Common white fish. What a good name for it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's much better in Danish, which means hero. So the hero, the head row, uh, They've been fishing in the same methods for this fish for hundreds of years. It's called by uh, Bulga. Uh, it's a set net, it's like a net trap, where the fish is when the fish is migrating when it's actually spawning, they go around in groups and then they come into specific areas and run into these uh, uh, small shallows where these nets are, and they get stuck in the trap and we take them out and we use uh, we sell the fish. The whole fish goes to smoking in uh, out in the sand smoking and we get thrown. And then uh, we've worked a lot with them and tried to sell it in the sacks, but found out that the market is not really for it because it's quite hard actually to clean it the right way. But we have a lot of experience in cleaning these types of rows because we have the longfish row, which we clean a lot of. Uh, so we have taken it down there and we've tried to make something that is 100% sustainable except for the plastic that is back in. And, uh, all the miles we've used on trading it. So we all the time try to create something that's great for the, for the end user and it's something that we can be proud of also. So if there's no questions, are there any questions? Yeah. I have a question. You talked about quality in the beginning. Yes. Quality can be defined so many ways. Mm. I also remember that isotope was a quality thing, and if everything is the same, it could be quality in some perspective, mm. not mine, but somebody else's. Mm. You also talked about uh, that you would fly in like uh, the sea ocean. What about the sustainability of that? Well, that is the thing. Really, uh, sea urchins, and if you go back to this photo, uh, That one. Yeah, that could be. So this technology, yeah. if we can create this technology, make it work for the uni, but it's not, it's not happening. Yet. I know that there's people working on this. Because if we can freight live uni from Faroe Islands or north of uh, Norway or wherever in the northern hemisphere, then the Japanese market is all, almost uh, inevitable for us to access. So really this is this is the way that we have to go and this is also that we're supporting this uh, we have exclusivity on using these tanks uh, uh, but really it is so hard for the economy to follow because when these tanks go by truck down we take off two or three of these jugs at the time and it goes down and they deliver to a lot of customers down there then the tanks have to travel up again empty all the way up to northern norway we need something to go the other way here so we're working a lot of getting uh, Vongole, cockles and stuff that we're already getting from uh, Holland into these tanks and then we're having them transported up here. But it is something that we need a couple of years into perfection, really. We, uh, I think for Christmas we had like a whole uh, back end of a truck, uh, it's called a cinema, with uh, 20 of these tanks in there. So we had all our uh, lobsters and Danish lobsters and, and Canadian lobsters and these suckers and brown crab and everything was intense there. But that's because we have such a huge production right around New Year's so we can fill it up actually. And uh, we love to do it all the time. But the market's not ready really. The market's not ready but also the technology's not yet there. The technology's there but logistics. You have to start the invention now, then it will be ready for the market when it is done. That's you have to be first. Thank you. Any more questions? No? Thank you.